العالمين السلام والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وبعد إن شاء الله today we will begin um, we will resume our ترتيل تفسير إن شاء الله um, I scam or I show you I hope today إن شاء الله that we will be covering some of the beginning of the Surah Al-Isra Surah Al-Isra Surah Ben Israel or Potom Khoyakta Ayat inshallah Amar Asha inshallah We'll try to for ya We'll try to understand them Because in this In these ayat There is great lessons That are relevant to our time now And it, it's It's amazing because we, we learn from this surah From the very first ayat About the journey of Isra and Mi'raj And it talks about Isra And Mi'raj How the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Was taken on that miraculous journey From the The house of Ummahani uh, from you know from Hatim from Kaaba basically all the way to Masjid Al-Aqsa and then back and that whole miraculous journey that we spoke about so many times before but what's really really relevant and what's really say for example it's it's relevant it's, it's, it's we can apply it to our time that we are in right now what's happening with Gaza and Palestine and the uh, and the uh, attacks on Masjid Al-Aqsa and what's happening as we know very clearly and our hearts and our and our, and our minds are, you know, in pain because of this. We see this as a lesson from the past because the Prophet wasallam also went through extreme difficulty during his lifetime. During his years of Nubuwa, we find that the Prophet wasallam went through excessive difficulty, especially towards the end, towards the end of the Meccan period, it, the difficulties piled one upon the other and throughout the entire Meccan period, the 13 years, of Mecca was struggle after struggle after struggle from the beginning when uh, you know when he called out to Tawheed they disowned him they cursed him they called him a liar they called him a soothsayer they called him all sorts of things and then eventually when the when their anger increased they tried to kill him they tried to harm him they attacked him while he was praying outside the Kaaba all of these things happened and then around about the seventh year of Nubuwa, when more and more people were coming into Islam, despite the persecution, despite the, perse despite the fact that they were trying their best to make Islam look ugly, make Islam not appealing, trying to persecute those who become Muslim, trying to stop Islam basically. And yet so many people kept on accepting Islam. This was it was out of control for them, the situation for the Quraysh and for, them, for the Mushrikeen, the situation was out of control. And so they wanted to go further, they persecuted more, they put them in exile, they stopped trading with them, they stopped marrying with them, with the followers of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And the family of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, they had to live outside Mecca for three years in exile. It's a bit like, a bit like what's happening in Gaza right now for the past 15 or so years, it's an open air prison. It's an open, it was an open air, open air prison. They were not allowed to go into Mecca. No one was allowed to trade with them. No one was allowed to marry into them. No one was allowed to give anything to them, support them in any way, shape or form. And so the Prophet ﷺ went through this. And it was an eight, a, a, a three years long of, of hunger, of, of, you know, of poverty. Sahaba were eating leaves. They were struggling. And then eventually when this three year siege and this exile ends around about the 10th year, around about the 10th year since the beginning of the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we find that, you know, uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is extremely distressed and his distress is added to by the death of his wife Khadija and the death of Abu Talib. And this year became known as the year Amul Huzn, the year of sorrow, the year of sadness. And then he went further on. He went to Ta'if to look for some assistance, some help. And the people of Ta'if, instead of responding or giving him any hope, they stoned him, they harassed him, they set the children of the city to chase him out. And then when the Prophet ﷺ is in this desperate situation, he has no protection in Mecca because Abu Talib is dead. He has no comfort at home because Khadija radiallahu anha is passed away. Um, he has, you know, his followers and himself are at danger of being killed any time. And whenever there was an opportunity, they were being attacked. Ta'if was not an option too. So he's completely left, isolated, you know, with no one to turn to. No one to turn to. And so when he's leaving Ta'if, we know the very famous story that the Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, 
he, he, he stopped somewhere and he prayed two rakats and he made this dua. And that dua that we recite sometimes in our qunut, in which he said, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka dha'fa quwwati. Oh Allah, I complain to you about the weakness of my strength. Allahu Akbar. He could have easily said, Oh Allah, destroy these people. Oh Allah, kill them. Oh Allah, do all of this. Oh Allah, look what they've done to me. His conversation with his creator starts with, Oh Allah, I complain to you that I am weak. And the fact that I was not able to do what was necessary or the fact that I was not able to do enough. And I complain to you that I am very, you know, sort of, I, I, am, I am very light in the sight of people. The, the fact that they, they find me not respectable in that regard. Of course, the mushrikeen and the kuffar were talking about. And then he says that, Ya Arhamar Rahimin, Oh, the one that's the most merciful, the most kind. Who will you make me resort to? Who should I go to if I don't go to you? Who am I, who am I supposed to turn to? Okay. It says, Ya Rahman Rahimin, Ila man takiruni. Who am I going to go to now? My uncle is passed away. My wife is passed away. I tried Ta'if. I tried Mecca. I sent my Sahaba to Ethiopia. I was starving. I was hungry. I was patient. Who is going to take care of my affairs? Who's going to be my? Who's going to help me? Ila adu in Are you going to make responsible for me an enemy that will attack me and try to kill me and you know destroy all of my companions? Or someone that's close to me that will, you know, that is in charge of my affairs. And then he says, In Lam Yakum Bika Alaya Gada Bun Fala Ubali. That Ya Allah, even though I'm going through so much difficulty and so much pain, as long as you are, Ya Allah, not angry with me, then I don't care. As long as you are not angry with me, Ya Rabbi, I am content. What happens around me is not really is important, but it, I can deal with it. But if Allah is upset with us, if Allah's wrath is upon us, then we have no one to go to because He is our ultimate resort, the one that we resort to ultimately. And so it says, "In lam yakum bika alayya ghadabun fala ubali ghayra anna afiyataka awsauli." Except that, Ya Rabbi, I ask you that you have afiyat upon me. You take care of me. You don't punish me. You don't. You make my situ- you ease my situation in my affairs. And then he says, "A'udhu bi nuri wajhika aladhi ashraqat lahu zulmat." I seek refuge in your face by which the darkness becomes illuminated, i.e. I seek refuge in you, Ya Allah. وَصَلُحَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ And I seek refuge in you, the one by whose permission everything of this dunya and the akhirah can become fixed and repaired. And تَنْزِلَ بِيَ غَضَبُكْ That I seek refuge in you, Ya Allah, that you don't get angry with me. أو يحل علي صخطك أو that your wrath descends upon me لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا أنا have no one to go to to you I shall always return to this is the dua of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم when he was literally isolated alone you know in distressed completely and then slowly slowly we see the lights of hope come from different angles and the promise of Allah where Allah says that إن مع العسر يسرا with difficulty there is much ease with ma in fa inna ma al usri yusra inna ma al usri he repeats it. With difficulty, there is much is, and so we find that the Prophet sallam his thirteen years of difficulty in Medina, and then of course his his whole life was a struggle, and that's the life of everybody, in fact, and all of the companions, and every single person has their struggles in their life. But ultimately, we see that with difficulty, there was much is. That soon aqwam and you know tribes and qabail they came into Islam and groups upon groups of people from the Arabian Peninsula came and accepted Islam. And so the promise of Allah that inna la It's really hard to it's really hard to accept or to understand how Ya Allah, where is the help of Allah? Where we see our brothers and sisters being massacred and children being killed intentionally. More than a quarter of the victims of the Gaza strikes right now are all children. What was their sin? What were they doing? Were they attacking? Were they throwing rockets? What were they doing? They are innocent. This is genocide. This is ethnic cleansing. And so it's really, really hard for us to grasp where is the help of Allah? When is it going to come? Isn't it due now? Look at what happened to Iraq. 
Look at what happened to Sham, Syria. Look at what happened to what's happening to the Kashmiris on a regular basis. Look at what happened, what is happening to the Uyghurs of China. Look at what, what is happening in Yemen. Look at what's happening in Palestine. Not just today, since World War I and before. Muslims across the world, look what happened to the Ottoman Empire when they fell. Persecution, conniving plans against the Muslims to try and destroy them country by country. We see this, it's, it's nothing hidden. So you think to yourself, Allah, it's almost been a hundred years that we've been suffering in this way or longer. When is your help going to come? Mata Nasrullah. Allah says in the Quran, Am hasibtum, antad khulul jannah. Did you think that you're going to go to Jannah? ولما يأتكم مثل الذين خلوا من قبلكم and the likes of what happened to the nations before you hasn't happened yet you can't go to Jannah so easily Jannah has a price which is struggling for the sake of Allah and being consistent and being firm ولما يأتكم مستهم البأس that bats and difficulties struck them والضراء and harm وزلزل when they were shaken they were shaken to the core. حتى يقول الرسول until the prophets and the prophet والذين آمنوا and those who believe they said together متى نصر الله where is the hope of Allah? But it's interesting that in Surah Al-Inshirah Allah says that with difficulty is ease. As in the period of difficulty us going through it is part and parcel of going to ease. So if we ask ourselves the question, when is the ease going to come? Then know that we're already in that journey. In the journey of going towards success and, and, and ease and, and you know, sort of you know, flourishing, difficulty is, an, is, is a part of that struggle. So indeed the help of Allah is close, yes. Because we see in the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's the best of examples. Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In Surah Al-Ahzab he says, that ولما أرى المؤمنون الأحزاب. See, when difficulty strikes the ummah, people divide in different groups. Their approach is different. Some will say, "What kind of Allah is this? Is not helping us," and they will lose their faith. Some will say, "You know," some will become doubt doubtful. Some will become munafiqs. But Allah says that ولما أرى المؤمنون الأحزاب. That on the day of أحزاب, on يوم خندق. When the day of Khandaq happened, you know, when the trench, the battle of the trench in Medina, when all of the groups, different tribes came together and blockaded the Prophet ﷺ and his companions in Medina, and they were being attacked. And they had no help, no expectation. And in, in fact, within Medina, they had traitors. You had the traitors from within the, those who claimed to be Muslims, and those who claimed to be Jews, we had also traitors from them. So Muslims are surrounded. But the reality is that when the believers see difficulty like this, what do they do? Say, That this is what Allah and His Rasul promised us. This is going to happen. Difficulty will come. We will lose from us numbers. We will lose you know, our economic power. We will lose loved ones and, and you know, uh, and, and, your, and your plantation and your agriculture will all be affected. And that's what's happening right now. For us, even though we suffer and we hope for Allah's mercy and His help, this is all a testimony to the fact that Allah has spoken the truth in the first place. That this has to happen for us to be then successful. This is what Allah and His Rasul promised us. And so a true believer says, by seeing this difficulty, it's amazing. And that's why the hadith says, amazing is the situation of a believer that if difficulty strikes him, he is patient. And if goodness comes to him, he is thankful. So a believer is winning in both circumstances. So we see this and we say, subhanallah, Allah said the truth. This is going to happen. There's no way of going beyond it except for by the permission of Allah. And so soon enough, the doors of hope for Allah's Messenger وسلم, start opening. How so? We find that the human beings of the world have rejected the Prophet Sallallahu and they don't want to accept him. They've thrown him out of Mecca. They've thrown him out of Ta'if. Allah sends believers from the unseen world. Groups of jinn come and accept Islam. 
Then Allah brings to him the news of Medinans accepting Islam. He never expected. It wasn't in his calculations, but soon he hears that there are people in Medina interested in Islam. And instead of him having to go there and say, can I come to Medina? They come to him and say, O oh Prophet Muhammad, Ya Rasulullah, if you come to Medina, we will protect you. Come to Medina, we will safeguard you. Come to Medina, you will be a, we will be your home for you. So they welcome him. Doors of hope start opening up after extreme difficulty. Years and years of difficulty. Sumayya radiallahu anha was stabbed to death. So many Sahaba, the way they were tortured, Khabbab ibn al-Arat used to be dragged upon burning charcoal. His burn, his skin on the back was completely torn off his body. Bilal ibn Rabaha radiallahu anhu arda was tortured in the scorching sand. They would place a huge stone on his chest until he could not breathe. And when he was about to die out of breathlessness, they would say, except that Latin Uzza is your Lord. He would say, no, no, no. He said, Al-Ahad, Ahad. Only Allah, only Allah. And these are the best of people. The Prophet and his companions. The closest of people. Who are we? Our sins, our sins that we do, is enough to deserve the punishments that we get. This is Allah says in the Quran that that وَمَا, وَمَا أَصَابَتْكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ All of the masaib and the difficulties that you experience in this dunya are because of your own doings. And this is وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ And even that Allah has forgiven so many things. And so if we were to say that what's happening around the Muslim ummah is by our own sins, that would suffice. That would be a good enough excuse because we have transgressed. We have loved the dunya too much. The Prophet ﷺ said that at the end of time, the ummah will be so huge, vast in numbers. But they will be kal ghutha, they will be like the froth of the sea. Kal ghutha is sail. Like you know, in the sea, you have the froth, so much froth, but the wave comes and wipes it all away. It has no weight whatsoever. And then the Prophet ﷺ says the reason for that weakness is because of hubbu dunya. We love the dunya too much. And karahiya to we don't want to die. We just want to be in this dunya forever. We don't want to let go. Even right now, you'll be surprised and you see this around you. People are so scared to speak about Palestine in case my profile gets slightly affected. In, in case, you know, I become, I become, you know, I become a target or something. We don't even, we're so scared that we don't even know what's my legal right to speak about. It is my legal right to speak about Palestinians and their struggles and the genocide that's happening. There are certain legal limits. Yes, we know that. But we need to be able to let go a little bit. And so the Prophet ﷺ sees these doors of hope opening from Medina. Then Allah, so many other things happen. But from the things that come and console the Prophet ﷺ is, the, is what's happening in the beginning of Surah to Isra. Is that journey of the night miraculous journey from Isra and Mi'raj. Allah takes the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ from Makkah to Al-Mukarramah and Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam comes to him and he says to Muhammad come and he wakes him up and then he takes him to next to the Kaaba and he takes his heart out and washes it with Zamzam this happened before in his life as well at a young age and it happened again here and then his heart is put back together this is all of course in the, in the, in the world of, you know, of the miracles and so all of this is possible there's no doubt about it and then they take, he takes him to Bayt Al-Maqdis on an animal called the Buraq. And the Buraq is a very fast animal, which was ridden by other prophets before as well, others before. Because when Prophet ﷺ rode it and got onto it, Jibreel told Buraq, become firm and strengthen yourself, stay steady, because this is the best person that will ever ride you, as in the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And so they journey onto Bayt al Maqdis, and then the Prophet ﷺ ties up this Buraq, where all of the Prophets, when they would come to Bayt al Maqdis, they would tie up their animals. And as you know, Bayt al Maqdis and Masjid al Aqsa is the home of so many Prophets. Musa والسلام, came there, Dawood and Sulaiman were there, Ibrahim and Lut, they done the Hijrah to there. It was the home of Maryam. والسلام, of the man called Imran, Ali Imran, Imran and his wife Hinna, and Maryam والسلام, and Zakariya and Yahya. 
and Sayyiduna Isa radiyallahu anhu arda. This is their homeland. So many Anbiya, so many companions thereafter at the time of the Prophet sallallahu And so he goes inside Masjid al-Aqsa and in that journey of course so many other things happen. He sees for example on the way he sees Musa. Musa is praying والسلام, in his grave. He sees passes by his grave. And why is his grave there? Because we know from other ahadith that before Musa والسلام, passed away, he made dua to Allah, Oh Allah, make me closer to Masjid al-Aqsa before I pass away. Because of the barakah it is. Because Allah says at the very beginning of the surah that Subhanallah Asra bi Abdihi Laylam min al Masjid al Haram ila al Masjid al Aqsa Alladhi Barakna Hawla. All of it is barakah around it. So Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he sees him, he meets him on the way, and then he meets him once again in the masjid of Aqsa. Allah gathers all of the anbiya there. All of this is, the, is, is in the miraculous power of the Almighty Creator himself. And so the questions of possibility and probability, how and all of that, it's, it's beyond. You know, we don't need to go into all of that. And so he sees all of the anbiya, he leads them in salah and he begins his ascension journey and he comes down and the salah is given to him as, you know, as a lifelong consoling for him. But nonetheless, this is what the story is starting off with. We will recite some of the ayat. Allah says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim You heard it in Salat al-Maghrib as well. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Subhanal ladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa." إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. This surah is called Surah Al Isra. It's also called Surah Bani Israel. Banu Israel are the children of Israel. Israel is another name for Sayyidina Yaqub عليه الصلاة والسلام. So they were all descendants. The Bani Israel are descendants of prophets and Allah tested them in so many different ways. So many stories of them. In fact, the most repeated story in the Quran is of Banu Israel and Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Allah starts the surah off with this word called Subhan. Subhan is a very interesting word. It means Allah is pure beyond all things. He is pure of all deficiency. When it says Subhanallah, and that's why when it says Subhanallah wa bihamdi Subhanallah al-Azim kalimatani, خَفِيفَتَانِ عَلَى اللِّسَانِ ثَقِيلَتَانِ عَلَى الْمِزَانِ That these are small easy words on your tongue but they are very heavy on the scale. Subhanallah bihamdi, Subhanallah al-Azim. So Subhanallah, Allah is cleansed and pure from all negativity, all bad. He is all pure. He's tayyib, he's pure. Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Alladhi praised and glorified is the one Asra. Asra yusri means to make Someone else travel by land by night. Isra means to travel by land by night. Asra bi abdi. He is the one that's glorified and praised who has done Isra for his servant, bi abdi, his servant. Bi abdi here is actually there for sharaf. Being the servant of Allah, as the ulama say, and it's a fact of life, being the servant of Allah is the greatest honor for the servant. The greatest honor that we can have in our life is not by pretending like you're not a servant of Allah. It's not by pretending like, oh, I'm something, I'm too great to worship God or something, by arrogance or pride. That makes you a very silly person. The greatest sharaf for us is that we are servants of Allah. And by this servitude, we have an opportunity to go to Jannah and meet Allah, inshaAllah. And so, Asra bi Abd, he has allowed for his servant to travel. Servant as in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Laylam, during the night time. Min al-masjid, min in Arabic means from. Al-masjid, the mosque, the masjid. The place of sujood. Al-haram, the sanctified, the sacred masjid, i.e. Makkah al i.e. the Kaaba. It's called Al-haram al-makki, the sanctified, the sacred land, the sacred masjid of Makkah. And Al-haram al-madani, or the masjid in Nabawi Sharif is there, of course, the masjid of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa, to the masjid al-aqsa. It's called masjid al-aqsa. Aqsa means the furthest. Far away, very far. Why is that? Because many reasons of it. Number one is that it's very far. It was very far for the Arabs of Mecca to reach. There. It would be a journey of at least 30 to 40 days, even by camel. Number one. Number two, 
also because from the two Haramaini Sharifain, Mecca and Medina are relatively closest. We know that there are three sacred masjids in our Islam. La tushaddu rihalu illa ila thalathi masajid. That there are three sacred masjids which have a speciality. If you go there, you pray, you get more reward. Out of the three, Aqsa is the furthest. Because Mecca and Medina are relatively close compared to Aqsa. And so on. And there are of course other meanings to that. But it's the Ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa, the far away masjid. And it's the name of the masjid. It's the name of the vicinity of the masjid. So the Dome of the Rock um, and the Masjid al-Aqsa are all within a, a, a rectangular shaped piece of land. That's all the Masjid al-Aqsa. And so it's very important to know that because sometimes you can get confused. You might think only the Dome of the Rock is Masjid al-Aqsa. But in, in fact, it's that whole vicinity that's called the Masjid al-Aqsa. He went, he allowed for his servant to travel there. الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَ That we blessed all around it. This barakah is dunyawi and ukhrawi. It's, du- it's barakah of this dunya and of the akhirah. It's barakah of the hissi and of the ma'ni. Of what we can see physically and in a metaphorical or in a spiritual way. How so? It's blessed because of the amount and the number of blessed people that have come there. It's blessed because the blessings of that land is actually seen in its fruits and its vegetation. The amount of olive trees, the amount of date trees, the land is so pure and so fertile that anything you plant in it grows very quickly, very quickly. And Palestinians are witness to this. And that's why there's so much greed over it. You know, who should harvest where, who should take their plantation land, and there's so much, there's in fact fighting and, and, you know, persecution and massacre over this as well. So that's of course in its physical sense. It's also blessed because of the, because Allah Azza wa Jal chose it as a blessed place. If you go there, you pray, you get more reward. The number of, uh, the, the malaika that came, the number of angels, the prophets that came in, and all of these things. It's a blessed land. And it's not just Masjid al-Aqsa, it's all of the lands around it. And the lands are called the land of Sham, which includes Philistine, which includes Lebanon, which includes parts of Jordan, which includes parts of Syria. And in fact, Syria includes Syria. And so the land of Sham is very, very big. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua, Allahumma barik lana fi Yemenina, Allahumma barik lana fi Shamina. Oh Allah, bless our Yemen and bless our Sham. It's blessed in the Quran, blessed by the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu It's sacred in the Quran. Allah says, Ya qawmi khulu al-ard al-muqaddasa and the lisan of Sayyidina Musa. And then he talks about, again, barakna allati barakna in, in, in the story of uh, Sulaiman and the story of Ibrahim. So it's blessed, 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 blessed. It's amazing. So Allah has blessed this land. Barakna hawlahu. And then Allah is saying, What was the purpose of taking Sayyidina Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from Mecca to Medina, uh, sorry, Mecca to uh, Bayt al Maqdis? And Masjid al Aqsa, Allah says, min ayatina. To show him physically from our miraculous signs. Innahu huwa sami'u al Basir. He is the all hearing and all seeing. This lunuriyahu and this uh, the ra'a or the ira'a is physically. Some, there has been discussions among the scholars, you know, was this a uh, was it a dream? Was it in, in his sleep? Or was it, you know, something like that? But the reality is, as Al-Qadi Ayyad and so many others, they come to a conclusion of, you know, Al-Qadi Ayyad was one of those great Maliki scholars, uh, and so many scholars, not just him, that it's le- reached to a level of tawatur, the multitude of narrations that talk about it, and it's accepted, you know, we can say as an ijma, that the Prophet Sallallahu actually traveled from Mecca. Ijma in the sense that basically it's, uh, um, uh, those who have taken by that tawatur, or let's, we'll, let's suffice with tawatur, that is, is, is the predominant and the correct and the most authentic uh, uh, thing to say that he traveled with his body and his soul, he, in his physical form. Why? Because Allah says, لِنُرِيَهُ to see, as in to physically see, the whole concept of riding the buraq. Buraq, what's the point of the buraq if it's in a dream? So the buraq is there for, to physically make him travel. Allah starts the surah Subhan praising himself. And praising himself must be for something very great of a task. And so therefore, the traveling of the body is what's great. And so that's what it's referring to as well. And so many other more ayat and ahadith that speak about it um, throughout the Quran and Sunnah. 
So he is made to travel. Indeed, Allah is the one that's all praised. He is all seeing and all hearing. Then Allah talks about, وَآتَيْنَا مُوسَ الْكِتَابِ Indeed, we have given Musa al-kitab. We gave him the Torah. وَجَعَلْنَاهُ هُدَى And we made it a guidance for Bani Israel, the children of Israel, i.e. Uh, the, the Israelites, we say in English. أَلَّا تَتَّخِذُوا مِن دُونِي وَكِيلًا Allah commanded in, in to Bani Israel in Torah and as he did in the Zabur, as he did in the Injil, that the main core message of all of the Anbiya is don't worship anyone besides me. And don't take anyone besides me as your friend, as your wakil, as your wali, as your, you know, uh, uh, the one that will come to your assistance, the one you rely upon and etc. As in don't worship anyone besides me. man hamalna ma'a Nuh. إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا That these were the children of those whom we allowed to board with Nuh. From here we learn that every single person, not just from here, from other evidences also, that every single human being in existence are from the children of, or from the people of Sayyidina Nuh and the people that boarded that ship with him. Before that it was Adam and everyone else that was left that was not on the ship, passed away, they were killed. And so everyone that came afterwards was the from the descendants of Sayyidina Nuh and from the people that were boarded on that ship. They were the children of those who boarded with Sayyidina Nuh. Was indeed a grateful servant of Allah. This is what gets very, very interesting. We have decreed for the Bani Israel, the children of Israel, the Israelites, okay, and those who claim to be, what well, nowadays of course, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of the Jewish people, they claim to be the Israelites, or they are indeed the Israelites, as in the, Bani, the descendants of Israel, Israel, as in Israel, as in Yaqub, alayhi salatu wassalam. وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ We have decreed إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ to Bani Israel, fil kitab, which kitab? In Lawh al or in the book of Torah, that we have decreed for them, لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ That you will cause fasad in this world twice. Allah is saying the fact that Banu Israel will cause fasad in this world is recorded, is decreed. And that's because everything is decreed. The fact that the rule and the force will come and they will lead, they will rule the world and they will cause also fasad is also known to Allah. But this particular, this particular ayat are talking about the fasad of Banu Israel. And it says مَرَّتَيْنِ Two times, but these two times are not restricted to two times because they they done more fasad than that. Mufassirun explained that these two are the major two fasads that they have done. What were they? There's ikhtilafat among the Mufassirun. What fasad is this? What was this corruption? What was this huge catastrophe that they caused? What was this nakba that they caused? There is ikhtilaf between the ulama as to when and where that was. But the, the, what's, what's being said in the Quran, it has been decreed that Banu Israel will cause fasad. And Allah will allow you to become very high and very powerful and very strong. That happened before. And it's happening again. When the first of these two times where they will cause fasad comes, بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادًا لَنَا We have sent forth for you, we have sent for them عِبَادًا لَنَا Servants of ours أُلِي بَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ Of mighty strength فَجَاسُوا خِلَالَ الدِّيَارِ وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مَفْعُولًا So when the first of these two difficulties that they came, Allah sent to them عِبَادًا لَنَا Servants of His and they were completely basically destroyed. First they had an opportunity to become, to, to rise high, to become extremely powerful. And then they were destroyed. And this is in history as to when that was. Was it, you know, around the 500 year before Christ? Or was it earlier than that? There is ikhtilaf. Some will say this is the story of Jalut and, and, and Talut and Sayyidina Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam. And it carries on. 
ثم رددنا لكم الكرة عليهم so they were destroyed for a first time then again ثم رددنا لكم الكرة عليهم that Allah allows for them to become strong one second وأمددناكم بأموال وبنين and we've aided you with amwal, wealth, and many, many numbers of children. As in their qawm becomes very big. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ أَكْثَرَ نَفِيرًا And we make you of greater strength, of greater number, of greater might, of greater presence. Why is Allah telling us this? And why is Allah telling Ben Israel this? Is to remind them, is to remind them of the fact that Allah knows it all. Allah knows everything is to remind them of the fact that Allah is watching. It's so that they can take a lesson from what happened before. That when they caused fasad, Allah destroyed them. When they caused fasad again, Allah will destroy them again. Ulama maintain that both of these incidents or instances of when they became very powerful in the world and they were taken to, they were defeated, it was in the past, it's already happened. But some scholars will maintain that the second Fasad has not yet happened. What tense is it? It's in the past tense, but past tense and present tense is not really relevant in the Quran because sometimes Allah is using past tense for for the future to indicate that it's going to definitely going to happen. For example, Qiyamah, it talks about you know, Wajaa Rabbuka wal Malaku Saffa and Saffa that your Lord and the angels they will come, they have come already. But it's talking about the future. So tense is, is, is based on siyaq, depending on what the context is, what the, what the narrative is. Nonetheless, ulama have differed, and this, this, this ikhtilaf is sa'ig, you know, it's based upon adilla that they have had. But what's mentioned that there isn't any clear direct or, uh, sunnah, hadith, to say who, when was the first incident, who defeated them, and when was the second incident, and who defeated them. There isn't an exactly a, 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 a date or exactly an indication of, of who they were. And that's why ikhtilaf happens. This is something that you should know. That in our deen, ikhtilaf happens where there is a possibility, where there's room for difference. Where the in evidence isn't 100% clear-cut direct. If the evidence is 100% clear-cut direct, then there's no room for ikhtilaf. Okay. So he says, ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَا لَكُمْ Then Allah gave them strength once again. And then Allah reminds them that in ahsantum, if you do ihsan, if you be good, if you fulfill your God's commandment, if you be good to yourself, to your Lord and to others, then the benefit will only go back to you. Allah is explaining to them, Allah is being soft with them, Allah is reminding them. Ahsantum li anfusikum. This is a sunnah of Allah, a, a, a method of Allah, a tradition of Allah, that if you do good, it's only for you. Wa in asatum, and if you do bad, and if you cause fasad, and if you transgress, then falaha. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ falaha. Then you have also destroyed yourself. Allah says not too long afterwards, in the coming ayat of Surah Al-Isra, that we will not cover today, Allah says, وَإِذَا أَرَدْنَا أَنْ نُهْلِكَ قَرْيَةً أَمَرْنَا مُتْرَفِيهَا فَفَسَقُوا فِيهَا فَحَقَّ عَلَيْهَا الْقَوْلْ فَدَمَّرْنَا تَدْمِيرًا Sometimes Allah lets loose the reins. He allows for people to cause fasad and transgress. And that in itself is a punishment. He, allow, he gives them the ability to transgress. And that becomes evidence against them. That becomes a clear cut proof against them. Allah destroys them completely. If Allah loves a person, then when they sin, Allah gives them a reminder. Don't stop. Allah does something, you know, makes them realize, makes them maybe hurt or makes them fall ill or something like that to remind, to go back, go back to Allah. But sometimes Allah allows for them to carry on. And that's what happened to Fir'aun. Fir'aun was allowed to carry on. Ad and Thamud were allowed to carry on until their own actions became evidence against them and they were completely and utterly and thoroughly destroyed. So Allah says, in, in ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. If you do good, what that means is, when we see fasad, and when we see corruption, when we see, when we see all of this transgression on, 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 in this world, we learn so many things. First of, Allah is allowing it for it to happen, and those who are doing the fasad will taste their own punishment. Number one. This fasad is connected to our sins also. Our sins have an effect on how much fasad and how much zulum is struck upon us. 
Because Allah says that وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٌ Number two. Number three, that this is the system. Allah allows for some people to transgress and then they are destroyed. They are brought back to justice and then it comes again and it happens again. This has been a repetition of history and it's happening again right now. It's in fact very ironic. The same people that were persecuted throughout Europe, now with the help of Europe and America, are persecuting the people who have never hurt them. Okay, these are historic facts. Jewish faith and Christian faith under Muslim leadership, they flourished. They had so much success. Yes, there was a political system, there was a social system in place, but nonetheless, they were free people. They were able to do whatever, they were experts of all fields. They were medics, they were physicians, they were scientists, they were all sorts. There was no limitations on them at all. And now, these people of Philistine who welcomed them, Philistine before the World War I under the rulership of the Ottoman Empire, Al Khilaf al Uthmaniyya, was a free land. It was everybody used to live in harmony together. And now we see, not too long after, you know, the very same people that were welcomed with open arms, not the exact same people, but you know, that kind of, you know, people of, of that kind of background, if you like, the situation is there. Hasbunallah wa al wakil. كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّ Allah says, إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ أَحْسَنْتُمْ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ If you do good, you do good for yourself. وَإِنْ أَسَأْتُمْ فَلَهَا And if you be bad, then it's for you as well. It's going to go against you. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ And when the second time, Allah says, remember, He said, twice you will cause massive fasad. You will cause fasad anyway, but this, these two will be, they will be significant. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ When the second time comes, لِيَسُوءُ وُجُوهَكُمْ وَلْيَدْخُلُوا الْمَسْجِدَ كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ وَلِيُتَبِّرُوا مَا عَلَوْ تَتْبِيرًا When the second time comes, Allah Azza wa Jal will allow for them to go into the Masjid Al-Aqsa كَمَا دَخَلُوهُ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ the way they entered in the first place. But these people that will come, they will come a second time and they will be able to defeat them. They will be again defeated for a second time. The second defeat, some historians, some muarrikhun, some ulama, some mufassirun say it was when the Romans came. First it was BC and then it was after Christ during the time of the Roman Empire when they were persecuted and the Banu Israel were defeated once again. First they had a huge power, then after Christ they were defeated and they were persecuted and all of that happened. But some ulama say that this is still to come when they will reach such a peak of power that they will become extremely powerful and then they will be defeated once again. Yes? Banu Israel, you said um, the descendants of Yaqub. Mm. So is that Yusuf and his brothers or the people of that? Kibbutz? Yeah, so it would be, so Ishaq and Yaqub, you know, uh, his children, he's from his progeny. From his progeny. Geographically, they went to Egypt, but from where? They went to Egypt from where? They went to Madian. They went to from they went to they went to Median, they went to Egypt. From where? I can't recall right now. From from where exactly I can't recall right now. It was um inshallah, I'll find I'll revise and I'll tell you inshallah. But the point being is they are the descendants of Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. And the second time that they arise and they become extremely powerful and then they are again taken, you know, they, they are brought to justice if you like. When is that exactly? There is a possibility that this could be that time. There is a possibility. Allah then carries on to give invitation to them of rahmah. Perhaps Allah will have mercy upon you. If you turn back, Allah will also forgive you. Allah will also turn back. And if you don't, and if you carry on, if you persist, and if you claim to be the chosen people, as some do now, if you claim to be the chosen people, and you have a right to do whatever you want, and that the, the, the blood of your enemy is cheap, and you can kill them and do whatever you want, then Allah is saying, Jahannam is enough. Jahannam is hasid, is a encompassing, is a scorching fire for the kuffar and for the disbelievers who have transgressed and gone beyond all boundaries. Lessons are numerous from this passage. 
We spoke about some of them that we ourselves as believers take from that of patience, of resilience, of the fact that Allah's promise is true. It's inevitable. It's just a matter of time when Allah wills for it to happen. As for what's the future of this ummah and this calamity that we are in now, Allahu A'lam. Could it be that second transgression which is then brought to justice once again? Now, of course, we must make a differentiation. You know, not every person that claims to be of Jewish faith is supporting what's happening in, uh, in Israel or in Palestine. They are not. And we've seen that in our process as well. There are many, many Jewish people. And there is a differentiation, there is a difference, pe difference between the state of Israel and Jewish faith. And this, I said, that's a separate discussion for a separate time. But the point being is, you know, there has to be, we have to make that differentiation. We have to make that differentiation. That when we speak about the crimes of the state of Israel and what they're doing to the Palestinians of massacre, of genocide, and etc., it does not necessarily incriminate or entail the whole of the people of the Jewish faith. This is very clear differentiation that we need to make. Nonetheless, this is a very interesting passage, and ulama have approached it from different angles. But the point being is, we have lessons to learn from this as well. Which is that the help of Allah is, is nonetheless going to come. Allah says, Inna lanansur rusulana walladheena amanu. Allah will help His prophets and those who believe fil hayatid dunya, in this worldly life. Wa yawma yaqoom al ashad, and when the days, when the day of the testimony, as in the yawm al qiyamah. So the point being is, inshallah, we hope for the best. And we hope that this situation that we are in now, Allah brings about success and victory to the oppressed and Allah brings about peace and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, gives us ability you know to be steadfast and continue to worship and continue to call him and continue to uh, uh, be active in all of the ways that we can we can you know possibly within our remits to do something for the Palestinian cause for the people of our uh, of our Palestine of our Aqsa you know and to be able to challenge the narrative because at the moment it's bizarre the oppressor pretends to be the victim and the victim is made out to be the oppressor if this isn't the meaning of Dajjal then what is Dajjala Yudajjilu mean or Dajjala Dajjala is to cover up what's true and to do, towards the end of time I'm not saying that Dajjal is here by the way I'm saying towards the end of time as we learn from a hadith that you know, truth will become falsehood and falsehood will become truth. And that you will see that the people of right, people of, people of, uh, people of truth will be called the liars and the people of lies will become the people of the peacekeepers. And Allah says this very clearly in the Quran that they claim to be Allah in Nahum, that you know, in the worst ayah, Ulaika inna ladina. hypocrisy and pretending to be good on the outside, but actually you're bad inside. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ You tell these people, why are you causing corruption on earth? Why are you colonizing somebody else's land? Why are you causing a genocide? Why are you trying to ethnically cleanse these people? إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُصْلِحُونَ We're just trying to do good. And we saw this in a clip, where the, this guy, he says, you know, I, have, I, I, want, I want good for Palestinians more than their own leaders. I'm sure you saw that clip. They are in fact the ones that are causing the facade. So the point being is, you know, we are at very, very trying times, very difficult times. What do we do? What we need to do, Allah says, When facade appears on bar and on bahar, on land and on sea, and what we can see around the world is facade. If you start from global warming to the pandemic, to war against huma to crimes against humanity, you know, to wars upon wars of and crimes upon crimes, war crimes against humanity, viola violations of human rights, all of these things, we see that facade upon facade, Allah says, 
All of this is supposed to make us turn back to Allah. When the story of Sayyidina Yunus والسلام, occurred, when Allah brought, Allah says, that فَلَوْلَا كَانَتْ قَرْيَةٌ آمَنَتْ فَنَفَعَهَا إِيمَانُهَا إِلَّا قَوْمَ Yunus. When Allah's punishment is there, about to, be, about to strike a nation, it usually doesn't make a U-turn. Because the punishment only comes after it's been decided that they have no, they, they, are, they have no interest in becoming better people. But Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam, their punishment, they could see it. They saw their punishment approaching. But then they started to do istighfar and tawbah and sincerely repenting to Allah. And this was coincided and this was also matched with the istighfar and tawbah of Sayyidina Yunus while he was inside the belly of the hut. Yunus alayhi salatu wasalam, he went to see, he was supposed to stay with his people, but he made that journey to try and get away from them because he was so distressed by, by their transgression and their rejection. He, he boarded, he boarded a ship and he tried to leave them. And then Allah Azza wa Jalla narrates that story in Surah Al-Anbiya, in Surah to, uh, and so many other surahs. Allah talks about the story of Sayyidina Yunus. The adab is about to strike. But because of the istighfar and tawbah, Allah changed the situation. Sayyidina Yunus says, in Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah quotes, وَذَنُّونِ إِذْ ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَلَّا النَّقْدِرْ عَلَيْهِ فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ He calls out to Allah in the darknesses. So many darknesses. What are the darknesses? Ulama list. Darkness of the night. Darkness of the bottom of the ocean. The darkness of the belly of the whale. There is no one nowhere to be able to even think. He, no one knows of his existence at that time. Only Allah knows. فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ In the darknesses he calls out. When there is no one there. That there is no one worthy of worship besides you, Ya Rabbi. Subhanak. Praised you are, cleansed you are, pure you are from all deficiency, all negativity. He confesses, I have wronged. And this was then also matched with the istighfar and tawbah of his people. And subhanallah, by his istighfar and tawbah, see, one of the things about Allah's rahmah and Allah's forgiveness is that when Allah is kind to us, He doesn't just do what we ask for, He does more. So if you do istighfar and tawbah, Allah doesn't just forgive your sins, He does more than that. That's amazing and that's throughout the Quran. So for example, if you do istighfar and tawbah properly, Allah forgives your sins, number one. He wipes your slate clean. That's the first benefit. Second benefit, Allah will change your bad deeds into good deeds. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ The one who does tawbah and does amal salih, good deeds and continues to be persistent and consistent, Allah will change his bad deeds into good deeds. الله أكبر. Then Allah says the benefits and the fawaid of istighfar are so many. Allah says in surah for example, Nuh. If you ask Allah for forgiveness, Allah will forgive you as we said. He will change your bad deeds into good deeds. He will send the skies to you with healthy rain. He will save you from famines and droughts and etc. Allah will make nature in your favor. Allahu Akbar. For istighfar and tawbah. And he will aid you with children. Sorry, wealth and children. If you do istighfar, Allah says, remember, in ahsantum ahsantum li anfusikum, asa rabbukum an yarhamakum, wa amdadnaakum bi amwalin wa banin. That if you change, Allah will help you. If you do istighfar and tawbah, Allah will aid you with mal and banin, wealth and progeny. Al-mal wal banuna zinatu al-hayat al-dunya. The life and its beauty and its strength is through wealth and progeny and numbers, right? And so Allah is saying that istighfar and tawbah is our way to success, is our way to, is our way to come to terms with our Creator. So what's my advice for our situation that we are in? We as an ummah are indebted. We are in, we are in, in, in depths of our own sins. We must do istighfar and tawbah sincerely. If we can get the forgiveness of Allah, then we're successful in this dunya and in the akhirah. وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا if you return, Allah will come back. The one that walks towards Allah, Allah comes running towards that person. The one that comes one step towards Allah, Allah comes two steps. We need to do istighfar and tawbah. Get Allah on our side. The one 
مَنْ لَهُ الْمَوْلَى فَلَهُ الْكُلُ The one has Allah on his side, he has everything. كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كِثِيرَةً بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ مَعَ الصَّابِرِ How many low and few numbers have defeated larger numbers by the permission of Allah and Allah is with those who are patient. So our ultimate solution right now is to have Allah on our side. Thereafter, whether we, whether we are you know, persecuted, killed, or whether we are destroyed or not, it doesn't really matter because as long as Allah is happy with us, as the Prophet ﷺ made in his dua. In lam yakum bika alayya ghadabun fala ubali. Number one. Number two, we need to make sincere dua for the situation around us. Dua is the connection with our Lord. Make dua and that will be you doing your part. Not because your dua will fly to Palestine and it will help, help all of them physically. No, but because this is your duty to make dua for them. The Prophet ﷺ has taught us this. When difficulty struck them, they made dua qunut as we do in Fajr. According to the Hanafi school of law, you're supposed to do in Fajr. There is a qawl in it that you can do in more than Fajr. But we do in Fajr, alhamdulillah. So qunut and dua in your own time, make dua as much as possible. Give support as much as possible. Whether it be financial, political, influential support and all of these influences have now come and supported and it's having an impact political support not really helpful you know in our situation that we're in right now because history proves that this is our country our homeland we are british so we have to say that our homeland our perpetrators are the instigators are the initiators of this problem this is historic fact there's no hiding from that so we need to push these people, our leaders, to try and do something about it because they have influence. If they want to do something, they can. If they want to do something, they can. And so therefore, to try and do everything possible, campaigning, lobbying, protesting, as long as you can do it in a halal way. There are concerns about the halalness of protesting. And it's valid, the concerns are valid. What if someone goes there and instead of trying to have a sincere intention that, you know, maybe this will have some sort of benefit, instead they're, they're going to free mix and listen to music and trying to collect numbers. This is nonsense. This is haram. You can't, you can't do that. But doing everything we can with full sincerity, full hope in Allah and conviction in Allah's aid and mercy. Make dua to Allah and be certain Allah will answer you. Because Allah says, Call me and I will answer you. Okay, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي When my servants ask about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِبًا I am close. I will call, I will answer the call of the dua. But فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي Let them respond to me first. Which is, come back to Allah. Return to Allah. And at the same time, we can't just say, oh, just pray and no protest. Pray and no campaign. It's both. We take by asbab and by dua to رَبُّ arbab. We make dua. We do ubudiyya, we do istighfar, we do tawbah, and we do everything within our means, financially, politically, you know, all these things that we can possibly do, campaign, and inshallah. What do we do afterwards? Do we expect a result overnight? Oh, I made dua yesterday, all night we were crying, but tomorrow is still happening, the bombings are still going on. It doesn't work like that. You leave it in the hands of Allah. You've done your part. Leave the rest to Allah and have faith. Wazulzilu, they were shaken to their core until the prophets and the, and the believers said, when is the help of Allah? Allah then says, Ala, behold, and I say again now to end this lesson, behold, inna surely nasrallahi, the help of Allah, qareeb is very close, inshaAllah. Subhanakallahumma ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.